You know, I've been around for a while. I've met some interesting people. Done some crazy things. So you'd think that there wasn't much that could take me by surprise. You'd be wrong. The world is full of stories and science and things that amaze and confound me every single day. Incredible mysteries that keep me awake at night. Some I can answer and others just defy logic. Do animals have abilities beyond our comprehension? In Germany, an octopus correctly predicts multiple winners in the Soccer World Cup. Never expect them to predict everything right. Are sea creatures psychic? In Scotland, over 50 dogs mysteriously plunged to their death from the same bridge, leaving scientists baffled. Feet just left the ground and they were straight over. Are dogs suicidal? Or is a sinister force at play? And in Oklahoma, an ordinary house cat makes a 2,200-kilometer journey to find its owner. It never entered my mind that he had come by himself. Yeah, it's a weird world, and I love it. You know, I'm fascinated by the animal kingdom, these incredible creatures that we uh, share the planet with. But how much do we really know about them? Well. Uh, Quite a lot, actually. Take the moose, for instance. He's the largest of the deer family. He has 32 teeth and 27 pairs of chromosomes, compared with 23 in humans. Or uh, the dolphin. He sleeps with one eye open, lives up to 40 years, and has a bigger brain than a monkey. And quite a few friends of mine in Hollywood. And then there's the sheep. He's just stupid. But what about those animals we're not so familiar with, like uh, this guy? Huh? An octopus. Well, we know he has three hearts, no bones, and blue blood. But uh, here's something you might not know. He's psychic. June 13th, 2010. As Germany gears up for the long-awaited World Cup soccer championships, an aquarium in the town of Oberhausen is preparing to launch a unique publicity stunt. The aquarium will use its resident octopus named Paul to try and pick the winners of each match Germany competes in. Oliver Valenciak is a curator at Sea Life. We started um, to do the predictions with um, Paul just to entertain our, our visitors and to get some regional press. The idea is simple. There are two plexiglass boxes marked with the opposing team's flags. Each box contains a live mussel. Paul's favorite treat. All the octopus has to do is lift the lid to get at the food inside. We put the two boxes into the tank and um, Paul had to decide which muscle he will eat and this, tame, uh, this uh, team will win. World Cup fever runs high in Germany where huge sums are bet on the outcome. But at Sea Life, no one is expecting much from Paul who's never shown any particular talent for anything. Octopuses are quite fantastic um, creatures of the sea and um, it's um, very uh, funny to work with them because they interact with the keepers. It's um, very different from fish, for example. They can also interact, but not as an octopus um, because they spit on you or they play with your feeding stick or whatever. When I saw Paul, it was um, a very cute octopus, a nice one, but not that different from any other octopus I already met. On the day of Paul's first prediction, there is little interest in the story. There was um, very low attention from the media, and it was just a, a few photographs from the regional press. Oliver's not even sure if the octopus, which has never been trained to perform tricks, will even take part. The game against Australia was just to see if Paul is working like we want him to work. To Oliver's surprise, not only does Paul eagerly participate, he correctly predicts the winning team, Germany. He just had a lot of luck. But then something happens which makes Oliver question everything. 
about sea creatures. Paul makes another correct prediction, and another. And with each one, word spreads about the octopus that seems to know which team will win before the match is even played. The staff um, recognized that uh, something special was happening. By the time Germany faces off in a much anticipated match against England, Paul has become a media sensation. Also the international press um, wanted to have interviews. The Washington Post um, had an uh, article about Paul. Weirdly, Paul is apparently aware of the attention he's getting. He even seems to enjoy it. When the uh, first reporters came in front of the tank, um, he started to play with the reporters. So he really recognized it, and it seemed that he also had some fun. But nothing prepares Oliver for what happens next. Paul keeps making correct predictions as Germany beats England and Ghana and Argentina. Incredibly, he's predicted five games out of five without a single error. Aquarium staff are stunned. They can't understand how a creature with a brain the size of a walnut can beat the best bookies in the world. There is no scientific explanation for it. But not everybody is pleased with Paul. Fans on losing teams blame the octopus for their defeat and call for him to be cooked and eaten. The first death threats he got were um, when he picked the uh, German against Argentina. Paul gets in even more hot water when he dares to predict that his home team, Germany, would be beaten by Spain. But he's right again. And by the time the finals roll around, media interest in Paul has reached a fever pitch. You can imagine 150 reporters and live broadcasts in front of a tank, and you are there with the boxes and think, oh, God, do anything. I don't care what you do, but do anything, please. 700 million people watch the game between Spain and the Netherlands. Paul makes his final and most important prediction, eating the muscle in the box marked Spain. This was, I would say, the most thrilling prediction. Paul is right again. Even now, Oliver is still mystified by Paul's achievements. There were uh, thousands of animals doing predictions during the uh, 2010 uh, championship, but um, Paul was the only one um, having all eight games right. When the World Cup was over, we decided that um, Paul retires. Um, he don't have to do any more predictions. And um, unfortunately, he died um, in October 2010 um, because he was old age. Um, but we decided to cremate him and to put his ash in an urn so that everybody who comes to see Life Oberhausen can still see a memorial. Calamari. Oh, sorry. This is awesome, isn't it? I mean, if an octopus can predict the winners of soccer games, just imagine what else they can do. Now, this guy's name is Jeff. Jeff, pick the winning numbers of the lottery. Come on, Jeff, get, get the, the, the winning numbers of the lottery. Jeff gets a little shy, OK? So one more time. What numbers are going to win the lottery? OK. See you at dinner. How did an octopus make so many correct predictions? Is this evidence these creatures can see into the future? Dr. Jennifer Bather of the University of Lethbridge has been studying octopus behavior for over 30 years. Octopuses are very intelligent animals. Um, they're lots of fun because they're trying to solve every puzzle you give them. She doesn't think Paul has the ability to see into the future, let alone predict the outcome of a human sports event. The octopus doesn't have the faintest idea what a soccer match is and why everybody's excited about the World Cup. Dr. Maytha thinks the truth is the animal is simply figuring out the best way to get dinner. This octopus, I'm sure, was taken from the wild. and It has to learn new ways to get food. And what it's doing is scoping us out and figuring out how to get the best it can out of the situation. Even more revealing, Dr. Maytha believes Paul wasn't even looking at the flags. One of the things that people don't realize about octopuses is they're colorblind. 
So I think the German flag is red and black, and that really didn't matter to the octopus. So if Paul wasn't responding to the flags, how did he know which box to choose? Dr. Mather is convinced that he was using a sensory ability unique to octopuses. Through chemical receptors in his tentacles, Paul could literally smell the muscles inside the boxes before he even opened them. Octopuses are very sensitive to chemical cues. It would have known that there was a reward in each of those boxes. That would explain a bizarre quirk of Paul's predictions, that for most of the matches, he chose the box on the right, which also happened to be the winning team. What happens in captivity is that the octopus ends up doing what it's getting rewarded for. So it may go, well, yeah, I got rewarded there, so I keep going there. But if Paul knew he could get a muscle from the right-hand box, why did he sometimes choose the one on the left? It's entirely possible it just got bored and thought, well, I know there's one on the other side. Why don't I go over to the other side and see what's over there? I think he, he would have switched because he knew there was food in both places. And he would have switched because he thought, wait a minute, that's not the way the world really works. I know there's food there, but there should be food in the other place too. Yeah, let me go and see. Octopuses turn out to be difficult for researchers who want to study learning and memory because they're forever doing what the researchers describe as sampling the unrewarded location, going to see what's happening someplace else. They're like us. They're curious. They're explorers. So if we believe Dr. Mather, Paul's predictions were a win-win situation, at least for his stomach. But that still doesn't explain his astonishing success. What is Paul's secret to beating the odds? Sort of knew that there was some hidden mechanism in there. An octopus predicts the outcome of World Cup soccer matches. Is it psychic or just playing along to get a meal? Dr. Ray Ducryu is a professor of statistics at the University of Toronto and a keen soccer fan. So when I first heard about uh, Paul the octopus, I was not floored. I, I sort of knew that there was some hidden mechanism in there. What I like about statistics is that you take this big block of data that is hiding inside a great mystery or a great story, and you try to unravel the block and get to the truth. Dr. Crayu claims that he has unlocked the secret of Paul's success. It all comes down to probability, the mathematical calculation of whether or not something is likely to happen. To pick the winner of a match correctly, uh, it's the same as flipping a coin and calling it ahead of time. So it's 50% chance of calling it right. But Paul correctly predicted eight matches in a row. The odds must be huge, wasn't they? To find out, Dr. Crayu uses a probability tree to represent each of the choices Paul made. It helps to go game by game. So game one, you have two possible outcomes, a correct or a wrong guess. Game two comes, you have, again, two possible outcomes, correct, wrong, correct, wrong. Now, game three, same story. He comes up with a surprising result. The chance for, for this octopus to actually predict all eight games is about 1 in 256. Pretty small odds if we think of this was done at random. So, were Paul's accomplishments less impressive than they seemed? Perhaps. And there's another crucial element in play. Dr. Crayu says Paul wasn't the only animal predicting the World Cup. In fact, there were hundreds of creatures all over the world trying to do the same thing. We often hear about animal oracles, but we also have to understand that there are many others who have tried to be animal oracles and failed. With so many animals trying to pick winners, believes Dr. Crayu, one of them is bound to get it right. It's simply because it has to happen. By luck, by chance, it has to happen once in a blue moon, but it can, it, it can happen. The bottom line for Dr. Crayu? If we're gonna remember Paul for anything, we should remember him for being a very lucky octopus. So was it all just a fluke, or could there be another explanation? Author and animal rescuer Steve Cutler has been writing about the cognitive power of animals for nearly two decades. I'm surrounded by almost 30 animals every day, and the one thing that I know for sure is we don't know anything about animals. He doesn't rule out the possibility that Paul the octopus was an oracle. 
I think we have to keep an open mind about the possibilities of Paul the octopus, like we have to keep in mind an open mind about the capabilities of all animals. Every time we've said there's an ability that animals don't have, they don't have tool use, they don't have language, they can't grieve, they don't love, all these things are things we used to believe animals couldn't do at all, and we now know are absolutely fact. Cotter points to recent discoveries that have shed new light on the animal kingdom. A really great example of, of an ability animals have that, that we don't have and we can't even begin to fathom comes from elephants. In the early 1980s, researchers discovered elephants are capable of emitting ultra-low frequency calls. Their stomachs make subsonic, low frequency sounds. These sounds travel for hundreds of miles and elephants can communicate this way. They seem to hear these sounds with sensors in their feet. Cotler suspects something similar was at work at the aquarium, with Paul actually reading the minds of the people around him. I think there were a lot of people in that room who wanted him to select the muscle with the German flag on it. And I think he was picking up on that vibe and, and reading something. Could it be that Paul can not only see into the future, but he's telepathic as well? We should always come at the natural world with a sense of mystery. We should never, ever, ever come at it with attitudes of expertise or, or really any kind of solid ground under our knowledge. Because the one thing that we've learned scientifically over the past couple hundred years is every time we think we know something, this theory is right, this is absolutely how it's going to be, 20 years later it's been proved wrong. So trying to draw a box around animals and saying they have these abilities, they don't have these abilities, is ridiculous. What you have in this particular case is an octopus who successfully predicted the future eight times in a row. We have no possible way of understanding the octopi universe. We don't have eight arms, we don't live under, under the sea, we don't squirt ink. We have no idea what it's like to do those things, and that leads to all kinds of wondrous possibilities. Did Paul use precognition to pick World Cup winners? Did he just get lucky? Or was he just looking for food like any old octopus? Whatever the truth, this story is weird. your pet is thinking. Well, we all know, don't we? I mean, I mean we think we do. We, we talk to them and they respond. Watch, Fluffy, you want to eat some cookies? Hey, you want to go for a walk? Fluffy Wuffy, love bell, do you love bell? What? That's all, see? He thinks about food, walkies, and he's thinking about how much he loves me. That's all it takes to make him happy. But not every dog is like Fluffy. Others have secrets, secrets and thoughts so deep and dark, they're worth dying for. Did you say something? March 2005, Dumbarton, Scotland. Donna Cooper is on an outing with her daughter and the family dog, Ben. They're exploring a 19th century country estate on the outskirts of town. We'd been out for about two hours, and then we were just finishing our walk when we came up the stairs and came to the bridge. Donna doesn't want Emma wandering off, especially near the bridge. But busy with her daughter, Donna takes her eyes off the dog. I'm always aware of bridges, but generally you just say to the dog, come or heel, and they're generally right at your heel and they don't go anywhere. Suddenly, Ben rushes onto the bridge before Donna can react. Donna is stunned by what happens next. His feet just left the ground and he was straight over. His feet didn't even touch the bridge, he was just up and over. There was no chance of anybody being able to catch him or stop him. It just happened so quickly. Donna goes down into the 50-foot gorge to retrieve the badly injured animal. He'd landed at the very bottom of the bridge. He'd broken his jaw. His legs, his ribs, his back. So unfortunately, there's nothing else we could do for him. She still doesn't understand why the dog jumped. He wasn't a working dog or anything, but he was very intelligent and we had him properly trained. No, he was a very happy dog. I clearly don't understand why he done it. 
What makes Ben's death even more puzzling is the fact that it wasn't the first. Since the 1950s, over 50 dogs have leapt to their deaths from the Overton Bridge. Owners, vets, and scientists are baffled by these incidents. I think everybody has their theories, everybody has their stories and their ideas. It is strange that many other dogs have done it as well. My goodness, this is awful. Dogs taking their own lives. Doggy depression. Hound Harry Curry. What's going on here? I mean, they didn't even leave a suicide note. No. Seriously, this has got to stop. We, we, we have to help it how? There's only one way. We, we have to get to the bottom of this and find out where these deeply troubled minds went wrong. Tell me about your puppyhood. But therapy is good for you. Why did Ben die? Do canines possess complex emotions that make them want to end it all? Various things can cause a dog to be depressed. A series of dogs mysteriously die on a bridge in a Scottish village. Did they deliberately kill themselves? Psychologist Dr. Stanley Corrin has been studying human-animal relationships for over four decades. I don't think a dog is capable of deciding to commit suicide. He might kill himself through accident, but not through deliberate planning. According to Dr. Corrin, suicide goes against every canine instinct. The, the most powerful drive that they have is, is toward life. An animal caught in a trap will chew his own foot off, continue to live. Dr. Corrin believes an adult dog has a mental age equivalent to a two-year-old human child. They have happiness, they have joy, they have sadness, they have fear, they have anger, they have surprise, that sort of thing. They don't have the complex learned emotions, guilt, shame, embarrassment, those sorts of things. But scientific studies have shown that dogs can experience a form of depression. Various things can cause a dog to be depressed things like being socially isolated. They're very social animals. Uh, things like loss, like the loss of a well-loved owner. Any of those things can cause a dog to be depressed. The symptoms of depression in a dog are pretty much the same symptoms of uh, depression that we see in human beings. The dog basically acts blah. He doesn't move very much, he seems to act mopey, he doesn't seem interested in any of the things which used to catch his interest before. He acts more like a limp dish rag than the playful puppy that you used to know before. Part of the reason we know that this is depression in the sense that psychologists talk about it is that the dog's condition responds to exactly the same kinds of medications that we use for humans when they're depressed. So, for example, uh, if your dog is, so, give, is showing signs of depression, your veterinarian is apt to prescribe basically a beef-flavored version of Prozac, which is made by one of the major companies. And your dog will respond in the same way that a human being will respond. But could canine depression lead to suicide? The only reason why suicide might be considered to be a reasonable option is if you have the feeling that my current condition is awful and it's unlikely to change in the future. And the only way I can control this is by ending this existence. Dogs don't think that way. So if dogs can't commit suicide, why did Ben jump off the bridge? Could there be some other explanation? Psychic investigator Archibald Lowry has a monstrous theory about the Scottish dog suicides. He's convinced Overton Bridge is the scene of a heinous crime with origins in the distant past. He thinks the clues to the mystery are still there. Psychic memories, all memories, are locked onto the place of the Earth's surface that they were, they were generated. Lowry and his partner, Francis Ryan, believe dark, Supernatural forces may be behind the deaths. For the first time, they will try to communicate with the ghosts of Overton Bridge and find out what happened. Um, I said, 
Francis, let's see if we can pick up anything, because nobody else is coming up with any decent ideas at all. I know that if there was something psychic there, Francis would come across it as she walked up and down. She wasn't coming across it as she walked up and down, but I noticed that she swerved each time we passed an ingo, and I said, Francis, do you realize that each time you come down, you swerve towards one of the ingos? And she said, I didn't realize that. I said, well, this time, let's go straight to that ingo and have a look at it. Get yourself into trance and have a think as to what memories this part of the ground holds. On the bridge, Francis goes into a psychic trance. I feel a mist starting to come forward. Yeah, yeah, good, um, good. It's coming in a haze at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I'm not getting a full figure. I, I feel a haze. It's like feeling energy coming in. Yeah. Almost immediately, she has a chilling vision. She said, I'm seeing a big black horse. I feel he's coming forward in a different way. Yes. On the horse, there is a rider. He's a young man. Francis sees a young man named Edward, who lived in Overton Estate over a century ago. But on this day, he was on a fox hunt that took him across Overton Bridge. Oh, very strong will, very powerful. Edward is blowing his hunting horn, and the dogs are hearing that and following it as dogs do. But there's something special about the horn. The pitch is so high, only dogs can hear it. And it's giving out a sound which we can't hear, we humans can't hear, because it's designed to make a sound for dogs, to get dogs to follow the hunt. Suddenly, one of the dogs goes berserk and attacks the young man's horse, causing it to rear up in panic. He's given the feeling of tumbling and, and falling. Tumbling, yeah. Tumbling and falling. Yeah, tumbling and falling, yeah. Whoa. It seems to be his back area. Yeah. You, you, you were falling backwards then. That's why I'm supporting it you. It seems to be his back area, the, yeah. the back and the head. The Phillies head striking. Yeah. yeah. Edward is thrown and killed in the fall. He slides back down the hogs, breaking his back on the corner of that bridge. So cruelly, so quickly, cut down in his prime because of the action of a dog. He hates the dogs. Larry's seance on Overton Bridge has led him to a startling conclusion. Edward and his horse are still there. Laurie believes Edward's ghost is not only alive and well, he's still blowing into the hunting horn that only dogs can hear. But now, he's using it for a diabolical purpose, to lure dogs off the bridge. Are these dogs somehow hearing this blowing of this thing? to follow him and leap to their deaths. Can you ask him once again if you would stop letting the dogs hear that horn? Is he unwilling, is he? No. Is a vengeful ghost causing dogs to jump off a Scottish bridge? Animal psychologist Dr. David Sands agrees something is luring the dogs off Overton Bridge, but it's not supernatural. It's not suicide, it's death by misadventure. He's convinced the animals are being led not by a ghostly horn, but by one of the most powerful sensory organs in nature, their noses. With a sense of smell perhaps hundreds of thousand times more powerful than ours, once a dog picks up a trail, it's gonna be motivated to, to follow it and find out where it's leading to. What smell could possibly cause a dog to jump off a 50-foot bridge? Dr. Sands is certain there is only one, an odor so powerful and overwhelming, canines simply can't resist it. The mink, a creature dogs instinctively hunt. The mink has an anal gland that produces a, a sort of scent that is so strong you'd probably smell it from about half a mile away. I set up a, a series of experiments where we used the various scents of the animals that were detected around the bridge, so mice, squirrel and mink, we soaked cloths, put them into jars. I set up an experiment where we would release dogs onto a field and see which scent they went to first. And in almost every case, out of 20-odd dogs, they all headed straight for the mink. 
It's an interesting theory. Minks were farmed here until the 1960s. The doctor thinks their wild relatives are still around, and dogs know it. Minks are territorial, they leave scents. Uh, dominant males leaving the scent for other animals to pick up. But if dogs want to chase mink, why are they leaping off the bridge instead of running around the side? Dr. Sands visited Overton Bridge to find out. But once I got to the bridge, I sort of got down on my hands and knees and thought about it from a dog's point of view. He quickly discovered the answer. Dogs can't see over the wall. They have no way of knowing they're on a bridge. Because of the height of the stone wall on the bridge, they're seeing a wall. They're not seeing a 50-foot drop on the other side. It's a convincing explanation. Canine curiosity and a powerful hunting instinct literally drives dogs over the edge. A recipe of cues and signals and scents that have caused the dog to behave quite naturally, but for the end result to be disastrous. Did the hounds of Dumbarton jump to their deaths because of the scent of wild mink? Were they lured off the bridge by a ghostly dog eater? Or were they so depressed they couldn't go on living? Weird. Or what? A house cat journeys 2,200 kilometers through five states to track down its owner. In just some way, he knew where we were. You know, it's wonderful these days. You can travel with your pet, take them wherever you go, on planes, ships, they're totally portable. But not all pets get to travel. Sometimes their owners have to leave them behind, and that's when heartbreak can occur. Luckily, we don't have that problem, do we, honey? You ready? We're gonna go. June, 1951, Anderson, California. The Woods family is getting ready to move to Oklahoma, a grueling 2,200 kilometer car trip to the east. Rita Kolander is their daughter. She is eight years old at the time. All of my father's family and all of my mother's family lived in the same county in Oklahoma. And I think that we moved because they miss their families. But as they finish packing for their move, there's a problem. Rita's beloved cat, Sugar. Sugar and I loved each other. We played together constantly. He would follow me everywhere I went. However, Sugar is terrified of cars. Sugar just got wild in the car and would not stay. Rita's father finally decides they have to leave Sugar behind. I was heartbroken. We left the cat with a neighbor family, the Spans. I remember seeing Susan, my friend, standing in our yard holding Sugar when we drove out the driveway. And that was an empty feeling. The family moves to a dairy farm in Oklahoma with a host of feral barn cats. As time passes, Rita finds things to take her mind off of sugar. I got a pony, and we got a dairy, and had cattle and things that I wasn't familiar with. I think that helped me get over the loss of sugar. August 1952, 14 months after leaving California, Rita and her mother Ellen are working in the barn when something unexpected happens. We were feeding the cows in the barn while my daddy milked. And this cat, it startled her. He just purred. It was so obvious that he was a different cat than any we had there on the farm. The others were wild. We didn't have any other 
friendly cats. And the friendliness of the cat isn't the only thing. Ellen notices the emaciated animal bears an uncanny resemblance to sugar, the pet they left behind. I was so excited because I thought by some miracle, somebody had brought sugar or we'd gotten him there some way. But Ellen pours cold water in Rita's excitement. My parents were very quick to say, it can't be sugar, but it's a lot like him, looks a lot like him. Two months later, Ellen receives a letter from their neighbors in California. It's mostly gossip about their old neighborhood, but it also contains a bombshell. Her precious cat, Sugar, is missing. It said, Sugar disappeared two weeks after you moved. And we have never found him, never found a trace of him. Rita and her mother are stunned. They begin to consider the impossible. If Sugar is no longer in California, could the new barn cat be Rita's beloved pet? I really did not stop to think through what it took for that cat to cross the desert and the mountains and the perils that he must have come through. I was too much interested in the fact that I had my cat back. Did Sugar make a fantastic journey? In addition to deserts and mountains, he would have had to cross rivers, forests, salt flats, over 2,200 kilometers in five different states, not to mention encounters with deadly predators like rattlesnakes, coyotes, and eagles. How? He had to be a pretty good little hunter, and he had to be pretty smart, old cat, in order to make that trip, to know and to understand where he was going. Just some way he knew where we were. Had Sugar returned, Rita's mother decides to settle the matter once and for all, a test only the real Sugar would pass. When Sugar was a kitten, there was a little bone that stuck out on the left hip. When you would pet him, you would find you could feel that bone, and it's very unusual. It's not something you find in normal cats. If the farm cat has this distinctive deformity, it could prove it's sugar. She felt the bone, and there it was, the deformity. So we knew at that point that had to be sugar. How likely would you be to find a cat of the same color and the same size to have the same deformity? The Woods family is dumbfounded. How did sugar find them? I don't have a clue in the world how a cat would make that journey, how to follow someone to a place they've never been. That's, that's a mystery to me. It took Sugar 14 months from the time he left California to show up at the dairy farm in Oklahoma. It's a complete amazement to me, and always has been, how this could actually happen and how animals do do this type of thing. I don't understand it. I think he was trying to come back to where he belonged, back to the family he belonged in. How did a house cat cross five states to a place it had never been before? Do animals possess navigational skills we are yet to comprehend? We certainly know that animals have sensory abilities that we don't have. A house cat named Sugar travels 2,200 kilometers to track down his owner. How could a domestic pet find its way over such vast distances? Behavioral neurobiologist Dr. Vern Bingman thinks the answer lies in something science has just begun to understand. We certainly know that animals have sensory abilities that we don't have. So birds can detect the Earth's magnetic field, we can't. Uh, sharks can detect electric fields, we can't. Uh, bats hear high frequency sounds, we can't. Another is the ability to navigate. Dr. Bingman believes it's a skill domestic cats inherited from their wild cousins. If you look at lions in the, in the African savanna, or, or even tigers in, in some Indian jungle, they have very large home ranges and they navigate quite well 
domestic cats are capable of carrying out these kinds of navigational computations to a place they've never been to before. Dr. Bingman thinks Sugar was also using a phenomena found in her favorite snack, birds. Birds in general can take advantage of the stars, the Earth's magnetic field, the sun, to kind of establish compass bearings, to discriminate what we would call north, south, east, and west. Not only do birds possess an internal compass, they have something else that's extraordinary. A GPS nose that lets them smell their way to their destination. Homing pigeons can use atmospheric odors to navigate over hundreds of kilometers. Dr. Bingman believes Sugar could have used these same scent cues to navigate over vast distances. Somehow the animal from thousands of kilometers away is able to detect the smell and follow a gradient based on that smell to the home. Did Sugar detect her owner's smell from over 2,000 kilometers away? Dr. Bingman isn't surprised. He's convinced there's still much to learn about animals' innate talents. The last 10, 15 years has seen an enormous growth among scientists looking at issues that would be unthinkable 30, 40 years ago, issues in related to what we call animal cognition and animal intelligence. Okay, exploring the capacity of animals to represent social relationships, the capacity of animals to communicate, the capacity of animals to learn and remember and problem solve. There's a mild revolution going on where, where scientists are legitimately looking at the remarkable cognitive abilities of animals. I've studied animal behavior for long enough to, to recognize that nothing is impossible. Do animals have super senses? Are the best tracker dogs actually cats? Or is this amazing story just an incredible coincidence? Professor of Applied Cognition, Dr. Graham Pike, doesn't believe cats have super sniffers. He thinks there's a much simpler explanation. It's not a particularly cat-like behavior to travel such a long distance to somewhere it's never been before. He believes the cat that showed up in Oklahoma wasn't sugar. It's all just a case of mistaken identity. As a cat lover, I'd love to believe this story was a true. Everything I know about how human memory works suggests to me that this wasn't the same cat. Dr. Pike has studied cases of mistaken identity for almost two decades. He believes memory is unreliable and easily influenced by suggestion. Human memory isn't as accurate as we like to think. Expectations have a very powerful effect on memory. If you expect something to happen, then you tend to remember it happening. It's just the way memory works. But the cat in Oklahoma had the same bone deformity as sugar. How could that be? Dr. Pike believes Rita's mother got it wrong and misremembered the shape of sugar's bone defect. Hip bone deformity occurs in many cats. There are many cats that have that. It wasn't that sugar the cat had this hip bone deformity, no other cat did. Dr. Pike is convinced there was another even more powerful factor influencing Rita's mother. She wanted the cat to be sugar. If somebody really wants to believe something's true, it's actually not that difficult to convince yourself it is true. What's far more likely um, is that the people, once they'd moved, saw a cat that was similar to the one they left behind and became convinced that it was their cat. And in fact, their memories helped them with that. The bottom line, says Dr. Pike, is that the family wanted a cat they could love like sugar. If you really want to believe that the cat you see in front of you is your own cat, that you feel guilty um, for leaving your cat behind, that you really want a new cat to love, then certainly you can convince yourself um, that this is the cat. Your memory will start um, filling in certain blanks and overlooking certain facts. So if the cat was a bit dissimilar to the one previously, you know, it might be a bit thinner, it might have a few more scratches, then obviously what you do is you say to yourself, well, it's just traveled 1,500 miles, it's been through a really rough time, you know, it's a year later, it's a bit older, therefore it would look different. Um, but you, you don't have to do that consciously. Unconsciously, if you want to believe something, your mind does begin to tell a story um, that's the one you want to hear. So, was the Oklahoma sugar an imposter? Then how do we account for the dozens of other cases just like sugars? Cats live in a world that we consider paranormal. A house cat makes an epic cross-country journey to find its owners. How did he do it? Veterinarian Myrna Milani is an animal psychologist. My personal feeling is that the human-animal bond is 
deeply, deeply entrenched, probably right up there with gravity in terms of its influence. I think one of the things we forget with all animals, uh, but especially cats, is that they normally live in a world that we consider paranormal. They are always hearing things we can't hear. They are always seeing things we can't see. They are always smelling things we can't smell. And we don't think about it. You know, we see ourselves up here at the top of the pyramid and go, well, yeah, like, oh, you know, if you really work hard, you'll be able to see the world the way we do. And I'm like, man, I would love to see the world the way a cat does. Dr. Milani believes the mystery can only be understood by using the weirdest branch of science known to man, quantum physics. She's convinced the bond between Rita and her cat is like the mysterious force that enables some of the smallest particles in the universe to somehow align their spin, even when separated by millions of kilometers. Einstein referred to that as spooky action at a distance, because this doesn't fit in in physics. It can't happen, but it does. And I think that's the kind of thing that we're dealing with. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now, wait just a minute. I've been doing this show for a long time now, and it seems every unexplainable mystery can be explained by quantum physics. And frankly, no matter how many times they tell me, I still don't get it. Spooky action? What the heck is that? Joined together by electrons? Can't they just lay it out in simple terms for me? Oh. Dr. Milani thinks this form of subatomic communication lies at the heart of Sugar's journey. Sugar made it uh, to her new home, um, to her owners, because she had a strong, clear bond with those people as a clear signal. Think of a, a radio signal. Somehow the cat picks up on that and follows them. Do cats navigate using super senses? Are they invisibly linked to their owners for eternity? Or did Sugar simply fool everyone? Weird. Or what? So there we have it. Stories of extraordinary animal powers from around the world. In Germany, an octopus predicts the winners of World Cup soccer. Can a sea creature tell the future? In Scotland, dogs inexplicably throw themselves off a bridge. Do canines commit suicide? And in Oklahoma, a cat travels thousands of kilometers to track down his owners. Are felines guided by super senses? Are these stories proof that animals have extraordinary powers? Can we dismiss their incredible exploits? You decide. Join me next time for more stories that will undoubtedly be weird or what.